we're ready to get started today. Thank you everyone for coming and enjoying the amazing food. It was all hand cooked behind the scenes here. But uh, I would like to first start um, by bringing our elder Mary Roberts up to acknowledge the traditional territory. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Roberts. I'm the in one of the in-house elders at Indigenous Services here at BCIT. It is my honor to welcome each and every one of you to tsleil Squamish, and Musqueam Territory. I'd also acknowledge it's an honor also to have Aaron Nelson, our two guests, special guests from the North. It is a good day to come together and may be aware of one another. And I hope it's a successful day for each and every one of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I'd like to now um, uh, bring up our MLA of Burnaby, uh, Janet Rutledge, to say a few words. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I would like to begin uh, by um, uh, acknowledging and uh, thanking uh, the Coast Salish people on whose territory we are. And I, I particularly uh, want to uh, thank um, uh, the, the Coast Salish people and the, the Slabletooth people for doing everything that they're doing right now. Uh, to protect all of us on this coast. So uh, thank you for that. Um, also in honor of, uh, of what, um, what you're gathered here to do today, um, I would like to take a couple of minutes and tell you a personal story uh, that, that I reflected on um, uh, as a result of being invited to, talk, to speak with you. Um, in my previous life, um, I spent a number of years as a union um, a facilitator. And I was able to travel across the country um, uh, conducting workshops uh, where uh, union uh, members uh, learned how to question authority and uh, learned how to stick up for their own rights and stick up for each other's rights. And about, um, uh, well, it was in the early 80s, um, I was uh, teaching a course called uh, Women at Work. Uh, all across the country, but this particular workshop, uh, it was an intense five-day workshop. It was in uh, uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, where I was teaching it. And all the people in the class were women. And one of the, uh, the first uh, modules was on you know, the economics of inequality, and basically the history of women's work and how economics played into the wage differential. Now this was before uh, we had computers. And it was before we had PowerPoint. And so I had uh, worked on this big, long uh, uh, presentation that I put up on the wall. And I had collected all of these photographs and pictures of, of different kinds of women's work. And I had all these stats and arrows. It was a thing of beauty. And I was really proud of it. And it was all along one wall. And I used it to um, explain how women's work had evolved in Canada. And as I was making this presentation, there was one woman in the class who was kind of scowling at me. And she was like, you know, very, very unhappy. And then I got to the point in the, in the presentation where I asked, because I was, I, I was considered myself you know, proudly a popular educator that started with people's own experiences. And so I asked people to you know, put their own family history um, you know, the history of their grandmothers, their great-grandmothers, their mothers in the picture. And this woman, she stood up and she um, very powerfully uh, told me that her family was not in the picture, that I had wiped out her family's history. And she very succinctly and powerfully um, explained that her family, the women in her, in, in, her, in her culture, had always contributed to the economy and had always contributed to the, to, um, uh, to the richness uh, of their culture and explained the ways that they did it. Um, now, uh, I was very, I mean, I was 
like taken aback, I was shocked, but it totally changed the way I thought of myself as an educator and it totally changed um, where I thought I fit in to the world and the world around me. It was life changing. Uh, now, I was fortunate in that this woman went on to become quite famous. Um, her name was Mary Pinawanakot. And she uh, 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 later that year got fired from her job in the federal public service for speaking up and challenging authority. And it took her, and she worked in the Aboriginal um, uh, program of the Secretary of State. And it took her 10 years to get satisfaction that, uh, uh, and get her complaint of racial discrimination and sexual harassment resolved. And I say I'm fortunate because she became quite famous. Um, her union, the union that, that I worked for, um, took on her case, and it meant that I had an opportunity years later to reconnect with her and thank her for mentoring me uh, and, and making me a better uh, teacher. So um, I think what is happening here today is so important, and it means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet, for those words. I'd uh, next like to invite up our BCIT president, Kathy Kinlock, to speak. So good morning, everyone. And uh, I just as well want to recognize that we're on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish and Musqueam peoples. And I think we can't take that for granted uh, at all, that we really need to honor that. And we're doing so at BCIT um, more and it becoming more of our culture, which I'm so pleased to see and, uh, and help uh, lead. So what an honor to be here today and uh, to recognize the work that's been done. Wow, where's Shannon? I, where is she? Um, uh, Shannon, she's right. Oh yeah, of course, there you are, <laughs> being, uh, being in the back, but leading from the front, I'll tell you. You know, in terms of the funding that we've received that you've, and together with the FSA, have led this incredible movement. And I, I just applaud all of you for, if this is your um, uh, first time here, then that's great. But for the whole movement, I hope it continues at BCIT. Um, because Janet, as you said, this is an incredible venture. And this is a, cha this is a grassroots change in culture for all of us and um, for the organization, but for people individually to understand and work more together and in the wholeness of understanding where we come from. You know, I've been thinking about what I could share with you or would share with you in a short space of time. I'd love to share everything with you, but you'd be very old by the time I got finished. So, and, and probably bored. So, um, so I thought I would share a couple of pieces that have been more resonant, res, you know, resounding with me a little bit more over the last while, and particularly with the We For She uh, time. And our Students Association, as you know, just had a three successful days of, of honoring and uh, recognizing and creating their movement as well, as well as whatever's been going on around. And I think, you know, over the number of years I've, I've led, I've, I've thought, what are some key lessons and what are some things that I've learned so much as a leader? And one of them is to remember my voice and that I have a voice and no matter what position one's in, you know, um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. I, um, I yesterday had the honor of sitting with the Governor General, uh, who many of you have met here at BCIT as our honorary doctorate. Um, and so I asked her, how are you doing? And she said, I, it is, I never get a time alone, never. I can't think. You know, there's people, look at that man over there. He's watching me because he thinks I'm gonna get shot. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, this is not a moment of privacy. And, uh, and so from her perspective, that was, uh, that was a really interesting, you know, usually people say, oh, it's great, it's wonderful, and so on. But just that time to be alone and reflect and have, you know, have some time. And so she was sharing with me some of the things she's doing to escape, which are quite adventuresome because she's quite spunky, as well as um, uh, also make and carve time out for herself. And, 
And that's one of the things as a leader that and any of us, no matter what level of an organization or an activity or an, um, a movement we're in, it's really, really important from my perspective to get some time just to stand back and reflect. And I know I'm much more effective when I do that. I wanted to share a, a, a short story with you about when I was in healthcare. Um, there were many difficult decisions during that time, particularly um, where communities' uh, health services would be shut down, um, and there wasn't too much rhyme or reason about it. Uh, it just was kind of like somebody went along the map and said, well, this community's services will be shut or not. And, and, um, and I was a leader, and, and it was a leader where you got a list and you're supposed to go and then deliver the message, but you didn't have input into it, really. Uh, do you ever feel like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just thought it might resonate. I even feel like that at times. You know, there's always somebody somewhere that you report to and work with. And um, on this particular day, we were to start in a community in Delta and work all our way out to Hope to give the, the news to people in their various uh, areas. And I was teamed up with a senior leader, and, and uh, when I, uh, and he, he didn't have the best communication skills, and he read the fire hydrant when I went in to talk. So, you know, he didn't appear interested in the community. He just stood and looked at the walls or the art or whatever, and I didn't feel a lot of collegial spirit right there. So that was the beginning of our day. And by the end of the day, we got to Hope, um, out to Hope. And I don't know if you know Hope Hospital, but it has 12 beds, and it's, it's critical for the uh, highway uh, juncture for accidents. And on the way out, I, I kept thinking, this is really wrong. This is really wrong. I don't, you know, I don't know who made this decision, but it's really, really wrong. So there was a board chair and, and another person in the front driving, and, and I kept saying, I, I think, uh, I don't, uh, you know, we should look at this decision, and maybe we should just tell them we're thinking about it, because I, I'd really like to appeal this one. And, oh, no, no, don't worry about it, Kathy. No, it's fine. It's done. So anyway, um, then I noticed, start to notice people on the highway, and they had orange epaulets on their um, sleeves. And I, then I thought, okay. So I said, have you noticed a lot of people are going down the highway, and they have like uniforms, and they've got an epaulet on their sleeve, and it's orange? That, isn't that the Jaws of Life people? No, 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 it's not, no. So by the time we got there, it was the Jaws of Life people. They would surrounded and, and uh, from the provinces and, uh, and to rightfully raise their voice. And um, when we were at the event, I said, I cannot support this. And, um, and I thought, okay, well, this will, I wonder if they'll drive me home. <laughs> I was thinking, okay, I'm in hope. I have a, you know, a, you know, the cell phone reception wasn't that great. And so anyway, um, um, and we were put on, to show you how the community felt about it, it was summer and it was, there was a hockey rink and they put two two by four widths uh, and a table and the ice was in. So um, I think that was a pretty, pretty strong message. And I, it was very hard for me to, in front of a group, a whole community to say, you know, I really respectfully think that we need to uh, take some time and look at this and really reconsider based on your facts as opposed to the people around me in the circle saying a different direction. And I just, uh, you know, I came away, it was kind of a quiet ride home, uh, <laughs> but um, I came away, no matter what the outcome was, I knew for me it was the right thing to do. And there's so many examples that I can think of over my career. And, uh, you know, I honored Donna Mackay, particularly with the sexual assault situation, where she brought the truth to me, and, and it was because of that we were able to move, and I just, I'll never forget that. Thank you so much for doing that. You know, there's, so I hope that each of us speak our truth and bring those, bring the issues forward that we think are not respectful of diversity, that don't honor uh, each other, and particularly are not tolerant and taking time to understand where those people are coming from because those people are the same as us. They've got, you know, um, everybody's got strengths and they've got values and, and somehow they must feel a violation during those, those situations and times. And it's more, we're more effective working together and recognizing the differences we have and learning from each other. You know, um, so I just, I hope that BCIT continues on this journey. I'll do everything I can. I'll go to Ottawa myself if I have to get the money. 
um, because we just we need to continue. We've got something absolutely fabulous through this momentum, and and I just uh, I can't thank you, and I, I raise my hands to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, I'd now like to call up uh, Kenzie Woodbridge, our FSA Vice President. Thank you, Zah. Um, thank you also, Mary. Uh, thank you, Janet. And thank you, Kathy. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, as Zah said, I'm Kenzie Woodbridge, Vice President of the BCIT Faculty and Staff Association. And on behalf of the FSA, I want to extend a hearty welcome to all of you who are here and taking part in this event today. Whether through our action or inaction, our speech uh, or our silence, we are all contributors to this important conversation about recognizing and celebrating diversity and equity. Whether or not you will be up on this stage at any point today, you are playing an important role simply by being here, and I thank you for coming. Diversity Circles has been many things over the last three years. Uh, there have been big events like this one with panels and presentations on various topics. There have also been many workshops, uh, conversations and connections, both personal and professional. I'm incredibly glad to have been a member of the board of directors when Zah and Shannon came to us with a proposal to create diversity circles. However, I suspect I'm not alone in not fully anticipating how powerful and significant this project has been. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, Diversity Circles has been a recipient of funding through the Community and College Social Innovation Fund from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. And it's worth noting that it's uh, rare, or possibly even unique, to be listed as a community partner on a SHRC grant uh, as a union or a faculty association. Um, as it says in the description, uh, Diversity Circles builds on an indigenous model for post-secondary teachers and academic staff to utilize professional mentoring and community outreach for engaging student and community diversity. And it is that aspect of mentoring which is the focus of today's event. Mentorship can take many forms. You only have to look at all of the brainstorming that has been done up there on the wall to, to, to see that. I suspect it's uncommon for most of us to find ourselves in a formal mentoring relationship. But that doesn't mean we do not participate and contribute to a culture of mentoring in our work lives. Informal, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship is much more common and accessible for most of us. And research shows that it is powerfully effective at influencing individuals towards positive outcomes. On a personal note, I'm incredibly grateful to the people I have worked with who have so often demonstrated generosity in sharing their knowledge and insight with me. I'm grateful also to those individuals who saw some unrealized potential in me and encouraged me to take risks and put myself forward where I wouldn't necessarily have thought to do so. I'm also grateful to have had the opportunity to in turn support, encourage, and contribute to the success of my colleagues in their work lives and in their teaching lives. We all have the opportunity to make a difference and we can all benefit from the kind of generous and open sharing that a culture of mentoring implies. So thank you all of you, again, for being here and being a part of this conversation today. I encourage you to take what you learned back to your departments and your colleagues, and I have been looking forward to this event for <laughs> some time now. So I'm going to stop talking, and I will turn it back over to Shannon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kenzie, and thanks to the other speakers, Janet and Kathy Kinlock, to Mary for her welcome, to everyone who's here. As Kenzie mentioned, um, Za, Joseph, and I co-created Diversity Circles three years ago, and it's really been an amazing and very humbling experience to be able to share with all of you and learn from every, you know, everyone who's in the room, everyone who's attended events. We're so uh, so blessed and fortunate to have input from knowledge keepers here on campus in the community. Um, Alf and Mary are elders at Indigenous Services. Joanne Stone Campbell, the coordinator of Indigenous Services. Uh, Splash, Aaron, of course, 
uh, who is a collaborator, on the, a collaborator on the project. And we're very honored to have the guests from the North, as was mentioned uh, earlier, and everyone who's here. Uh, we couldn't do it without the wisdom of the community. I'm not going to say uh, very much about Diversity Circles. Kenzie expressed very eloquently uh, how it started. There is a handy brochure on your tables, <laughs> which will really break it down for you. Um, so I just want to say thanks to everyone. We're honored that you're here, and we're honored by the support of the community. And with that, we'll just show a brief uh, four-minute video about Diversity Circles. Thank you. So Diversity Circles was founded based on responding to diversity and how diversity is expanding in the communities in general, but also in the post-secondary education landscape specifically. The Diversity Circles team had the vision to convene an interrelated array of dialogues and workshops aimed in part at generating concrete, faculty-specific ideas about catalyzing the great potential embedded in BCIT's growing diversity. There's all kinds of elements to it. There's elements around the events, there's the workshops, there's the pieces that we write, but really for me it's about the relationships that we build through this process. I came into this and, and realizing that we could celebrate these groups using an Indigenous framework. When we think of an Indigenous framework, we think, okay, who am I? That's where we start. What's in your heart? And that's why we're seeking staff and faculty right now to say, what are your gifts? What resonates for you? Eventually, we're going to reach out to students and ask them the same question so we can match those two groups together. And then reaching out to the extended community, the people who are stakeholders to this school and saying, you know, what are your gifts? <laughs> and how can you be a part of celebrating diversity? Gifts is looking at really how individuals are holding gifts within themselves that they may or may not have expressed and providing a, a safe, again, a safe place to do that. You're then able to find not only similarities with others in a mentor relationship, but also you're able to express, you know, the joy and happiness that comes with that. My involvement at the logo, the logo existed already and I was asked to, to add some Coast Salish elements to it. They're part of Coast Salish art, but uh, they don't have specific meanings themselves. But to include those symbols is, is recognizing local First Nations, is recognizing Indigenous culture. The diversity circles to me means the many circles we have of relationships within this institution and outside this institution and how those influence each other. When we have an opportunity to listen and hear other people speak, they, they find something like, oh, I have that or I feel that. We're all connected in a similar goal here. When we increase understanding of each other, then we can have you know, a better and more positive relationship. And when we can be more empathetic to each other, we can support each other in doing our best work. Reaching out to students and meeting their needs, that's what Diversity Circles is about. I think having diversity is super important, otherwise institution itself won't be able to move forward and continue its adaptive capacities in being in innovative and uh, generating new ideas. Everyone's different and everyone's got a different way that they want to live in this world and I think if you can respect that and respect how they want to be living, to me that's diversity. It's, it's giving that space for everyone to be who they want to be. The success would be that our faculty and our staff feel very comfortable with celebrating diversity and for our students to see a place for themselves so that they feel comfortable here, they feel welcomed here. We're going to honour your gifts and here's the champions that are at this college already who are going to lead the way. Great. 
Um, I should mention that Sherrod, who's standing at the wall, can you just wave your hand? From Kari Communications made the video for us along with his great team and is here today if folks afterwards want to share any reflections on camera for another video that we're making about what all this work means to you. He'll be around at the end for that as well. Um, so I'm Kyla. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Member Engagement Officer at the Faculty and Staff Association. And, uh, I get to tell you about a few housekeeping things. On your tables, you'll see these sheets um, and you'll see some colored markers. Just feel free to write any reflections as a table. Just reach out, write anything down on there. We've been collecting these from all of our events and we've got quite a stack of them and we'll be using them as we do some of our reporting. Um, as well, um, we have our conversation guidelines up there. These are just things that we've been putting up at our workshops and at our uh, sessions to so just try and remind folks to share the time at your table, um, to share the time with others as you get talking and to listen, maybe not so much so that you can prepare your response, but so that you can hear what people are saying. And then you're going to hear the phrase eight by eight a couple times over the next hour or so. And so I'm just going to take a second to say what that is. Um, you'll see on your tables, and I'll explain what the sheet's for in a minute, a little version of our framework here, the framework on which this project is built. And there are eight colored circles around it. So at some point we decided we wanted to have some conversations around building a culture of mentoring. Um, in a smaller groups so that we could really get, give a chance for folks to share and get to know each other. So we organized what we started calling eight by eights, these eight lunchtime roundtable conversations. With We invited one person from each of those eight circles to join. And those are some of what you see up on the wall, some of the brainstorming that happened there. So that's what we mean by eight by eights. And some of those people are in the room, and we're going to talk more about this later. But just so when we say eight by eight, you know what we're talking about. Um, but now it's your turn to talk. So we're just going to take a few minutes where you don't have to look up here, and we're going to ask you to look into your tables and take a few minutes to go around the table and introduce yourselves. We're also asking that you, we've been doing a lot of mapping, and actually after the event, Dennis, where's Dennis? Dennis, wave your hand. You don't want to wave your hand. <laughs> One of our students, we've got a whole group of student ambassadors been working with us, um, has been digitizing some of the mapping that we've been doing, and we'll put them up on the screens at the end. But what we're asking you is, when you go around to introduce yourself, just grab the dots, the color does not matter, any color you want, and just say which one of these circles that you feel is most representative of where you, why you're here. Um, if one doesn't fit, maybe just throw yourself in the center of the bit there, because um, we know the framework won't fit for everyone. Um, and then just say your name and maybe something about why you're here today. Um, and again, we'll give you about eight minutes or so, so make sure you can share the time at your table, and we'll go for that. So until you hear back from us, please talk at your tables, introduce yourselves, and refill your food if you need to. But don't go anywhere, we'll be back soon. So we'll move on to our next section. I'd like to um, now introduce our moderator of our next panel. And I'm going to call up Sharn Singh. Sharn's a current mining and mineral exploration student. Woo! Um, and he is from India, and he's an international student. So thank you so much for coming today, Sharn. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sean, and I would like uh, I would be moderating the Indigenous Education and Community Panel. So first, I would like to introduce you guys to our first speaker, Aaron Splash Nelson Moody. He lives and works in Capilano Village on the north shore of Vancouver. He's an instructor at Langara, where he instructs in Langara's Aboriginal Studies Department in partnership with the Fine Arts Department which offers a unique Aboriginal carving series and is open to all the students. Uh, some other highlights of his uh, carving work have included several large works for Olympic venue sites for the 2010 Olympics here in Vancouver. He also carved the entrance door for Canada House Pavilion during the 2006 Torino Winter Olympics that was in Italy. While Aaron is his English name. He also has his Squamish name. 
Tosisin ye voila, which translates as Splashing Eagle. So I would like to invite Splashing Eagle to the stage here. I appreciate our brother uh, choking out those Squamish words. Uh, <laughs> we say you have to be choking on a fish bone to say some of them properly. <laughs> There's a bunch of different sounds in there. I'm Tohsun um, Yikwala from a place called Chiakamis. Uh, I live in uh, Homolchsen village now, which is in North Vancouver. Um, I've been part of diversity circles for the duration of the project, but I've been coming to BCIT since the Aboriginal Center first opened its doors. And at that time, there was, there was no training for the work we did. Um, Aboriginal people showed up in institutions and just tried to make things better. And it was a very different campus back then, uh, as I recall. We had some, some challenges for, from day one. And I've, I was only involved in the periphery, but um, the people who work here, they're, they're part of a much larger group of people out in the world trying to carry Aboriginal culture forward in a modern context, to use English, to, to go into academic institutions, to, to work in, in businesses, and retain the essence of what our culture is for the students who were in places like this. I'm, I represent the first generation of my family who was allowed to go to public school in Canada after three generations in residential school. And my elders said, um, said to me, they didn't, know, they didn't know what public school was about but they knew we had a lot of students there um, who were doing it by themselves, and they wanted them to be supported. So they said, even though you just got out of school, we want you to go back to that place. Um, and we didn't have a great experience, but they said, we want you to go back so that those students have, don't have to go through it alone. So since that time, we've been, uh, myself, um, uh, Joanne, uh, we, we, we do everything we can for our Aboriginal students. But of course, if you've been to the Aboriginal Center here, you realize that there's always food on the on the stove, there's always a place to sit and hang out, so everyone is welcome, and that's the Aboriginal way. Since time immemorial, since f first the Chinese and then later Europeans first came to these shores, the first gesture we made as Squamish people was to walk out into the water, to lift up our hands, welcome people in for a feast, and um, we think that's a, con uh, a culture worth continuing we think that it's important to sit down as human beings and, and speak and, and share teachings and tell stories, and then to sing our songs and to celebrate together as well. We think that's a culture worth continuing. I saw in diversity circles a recognition of culture, a recognition of diversity. Not that those people involved were in charge of creating diversity, but just recognizing it, just giving it a venue, giving people an opportunity to speak up about what makes them unique and how if you add all that uniqueness together, you land up with something beautiful. I'm glad they captured as much as they did, and I'm glad they started what they did, and I hope it continues. I've heard little conversations where people have um, learned something about the person sitting at the table with them and wanted to continue learning about the people who work in this institution along with them. Um, I think uh, I, I'm kind of lucky. I, I got to mentor with my, my uncles and my, my grandfather on the Squamish River. We sat around fishing together and telling stories about um, the supernatural world around us and also just the, uh, the goofy everyday stories that we had in our, you know, our family was just, they were very, they were full of joy. Uh, things were tough, but uh, we laughed all the time. So while we worked, we also, I also got to learn in a traditional way I got to hear all the stories. Later, I learned with a man named Halactin. I watched him in his studio for two years carving and then took up carving as a, a second carver for him for 12 years. So I mentored with my teacher, tried to combine that with some academic learning so that we could bring that out into the world, speak English, bring it out into the world, use it in places like this. I was thinking about uh, some of the mentoring conversations we had. And what occurred to me was, uh, uh, one of our late elders said, you can do whatever you want, or you can work with our youth. So she had these high standards <laughs> um, about integrity, about honesty, um, about not standing up in front of a microphone, saying the right things, then going out back and doing something kind of haywire, as she put it. Um, she said, if you're going to live a life, 
uh, of integrity and leadership. You know, you live a life of integrity and leadership. Um, I think that's important because we don't want students to emulate us, you know, being able to talk and not, not walking that talk. So I see some of the people, you know, who are involved in this project, and I think they've got high integrity also. I think they've got a commitment to, to making things a little better, listening a little, a little more closely to each other. And uh, when they walk out of this room, modeling that, we're all leaders in some situations, and we're all learners in some other situations. Um, even the youngest children, there's a couple kids running around here, there's kids younger than them watching them. They're teaching the younger ones already. They're not future leaders, they're leaders today. The students who are here, you know, this is, this is why we're all here. The students who are here, um, there's people younger than them wanting to be just like them, younger brothers and sisters, uh, younger students watching how they do things and, and, and wanting to be like them. So I'm glad to see that there's so many students involved in this project. The younger ones will be watching you and, and emulating you. And it's a big responsibility. You know, it's not just something we do, you know, for a program at work. It's something that we do in our life. I'm very glad that um, we have some elders here from up north. Since time immemorial, our people have traveled back and forth along these coasts into the interior and made connections with families from far away. Uh, I know we're family somehow, we just haven't learned how yet. Um, but I'm very touched by these, these beautiful elders coming to our territories here and, um, and bringing their gifts, bringing their teachings. In our ceremony, we, we say that if we only invite people to our potlatches that we know, we only invite our family to potlatches, we're like poor. That's how it was explained, we're poor. Because when we have one teaching, and in our potlatch we have people from, from many places, people we've never even heard of before, people that look completely different than us and speak completely different than us. If those people get up and tell their stories and share their teachings, we're told that we'll be rich. So in, in our ancient Slaashan that happened here, we, we not only uh, appreciate diversity, we, we believe that it's vital for survival. Since time immemorial in this place, people have been celebrating the joining of different teachings. And after we, after we do long, long, long ceremony and share lots of words, um, people take off their regalia and just sing and dance and play together because that's also important. Sit down, share a meal. It's a very, very um, just basic, beautiful human activity. So I'm very glad to sit in a circle with you all today and to share a meal and uh, to learn um, much more than I'm, than I'll ever be able to share. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you for my, um, my involvement in this program. And I'd love to see it continue in the, all the little ways now that we know a little bit more about each other, now that we know a little bit more about how to make each other feel comfortable in this institution. I'd, I'd, I'm looking forward to coming for another 20 years and seeing how this grows. So thank you for today. I'll see him. Thank you, Splash, for sharing his views. Now I would like to welcome our next panelist, Adina Williams. Uh, she's from Skarmish Nation and grew up on the Capilano Reserve in West Vancouver. She also descends from Namgis people from the Alert Bay, BC. Adina is currently a fourth year student at UBC where she is uh, majoring in First Nations and Indigenous Studies with minor in Anthropology. Adina is highly involved in the, both the UBC and the Squamish Nation communities as a youth uh, leader, speaker, and advocate. Today, Adina will speak about her student and community advocate perspective at UBC and beyond. Great, thank you. A hawk squad, no I up and see him. Next out south, they say I. Ye kwa we las, kwean ko shaman, Adina Williams, kwean sna, chen wa, skohomish stamoch. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, 
As was said, my name is Adina Williams. My Kwakwakiwak name is Yekwawilas, and I am from the Squamish Nation. Um, I'm just here today. I really want to just talk about my, a little bit about my experience as a university student at UBC and some of the challenges that I have encountered and how certain mentors along my journey have helped me overcome some of these challenges. Um, so to start off, I'm, I am the first person in my family to go to university. And uh, when I graduate next year, uh, hopefully next year, um, <laughs> I, I'll be the first person in my family, in my immediate family, to have a university degree. And so that's one common circumstance of Indigenous students on any post-secondary campus and uh, a challenge um, nonetheless. But there are many challenges, and so I really want to delve into um, a particular challenge that I've been speaking about in the last few weeks, and that's about having difficult conversations in the classroom. Um, this has been this has come to light for me in the last couple weeks um, in the context of the uh, Colton Bushi and Tina Fontaine verdicts. Uh, that sparked a lot of conversation in my classrooms, and I'm really, really grateful for that because these are very important and very necessarily necessary and very timely conversations to be having. Um, but I, I do want to talk about the differences of the conversations that I've had, and um, I, I'm very lucky this term. I'm in four courses, and all of them have significant Indigenous content in them, but they're very. Um, different in who's in the class and who my classmates are and who the professors are. Um, and how we had these conversations had different outcomes for me personally as, a, as an Indigenous student. So I'll describe the first circumstance. Uh, it was the first conversation we had in the classroom and we, um, of course, the verdicts happened when we were um, when UBC was on reading break. And so we came back to the campus and this was the first this was the, the topic of discussion. And um, I'm really glad we had the conversations. But in this first class, it was a, around a, a 40 person class. And we all got into a circle. And we talked about it. And all of the students in my class um, self-identified as, as non-Indigenous students and acknowledged where they're coming from into this conversation. But it was really, I, I left that room feeling really frazzled because the students, my classmates just were seemingly unaware of the harm in some of the things that they were saying. They were some of the the racist and stereotypical narratives that were I I, I am personally very used to hearing in in the media and on on TV and on the radio and especially on social media. And while this conversation was meant to kind of help us better understand the situation. As I said, I left feeling very frazzled, and a lot of that had to do with the way the conversation was navigated. And um, when these racist remarks were coming up, uh, my my professor was kind of glancing towards me, wanting me to unpack these narratives and confront these remarks. And usually, I would take advantage of that opportunity. But I myself was coming into this conversation very flustered and angry and still trying to collect my own thoughts about what I thought about this verdict and trying to really unpack it myself personally. And so, as I said, frazzled. I, I left that conversation feeling very anxious and it was, it was an experience. But um, I'll talk about the next class. It was an Indigenous Studies class that we had this conversation. Same thing, smaller class size, maybe around 15 of us. We sat in a circle and we talked about it. And my professor is an Indigenous professor and understood the sensitivity of the topic. And given that we're an Indigenous Studies class and we're mostly all Indigenous Studies majors, um, the students were more informed. And it was an equally uncomfortable and hard conversation to have, but at the same time, it was a safer space to have it because the students were well informed. The professor was well informed. The professor knew how to navigate the conversation. And I left that class feeling very refreshed, feeling that I had a sense of direction of how to go forward, looking at the verdicts and looking forward at 
a, a variety of things coming out of this class. And it was the kind of, it was a healing circle, I would call it. It was very healing for me to hear because that whole week I'd been uh, frustrated with um, some of the remarks that had been made in the media and then in my previous classroom. And so, uh, of course, the underlying problem here is, you know, we have a bunch of university students who have I, I think who have made it to the university without, with very minimal knowledge of indigenous histories and knowledges and the racism behind it. And so that, that, that's a problem, but that's not what I wanna focus on here today. Um, you know, that, that's a conversation that's having, you know, implementing indigenous content into K to 12 and post-secondary classrooms. Um, what I wanna focus and underscore here today is the importance of indigenous faculty and staff on campus, because in the meantime, the indigenous faculty and staff who I've encountered during my time at UBC have been very critical support systems for indigenous students like myself who are having to have these conversations and then in turn, um, you know, it's either good or it's very bad. And of course, that's not the sole purpose of indigenous faculty and staff, but I have got to say that without these people here to um, navigate these conversations and help me personally move forward in a way that is hopeful and um, I, I don't know if I could do it without them. And so I do want to underscore the importance of Indigenous faculty and staff who have, um, you know, they're coming to the campus with similar lived experiences as I am and as my peers are as Indigenous students. And the, there's, there's a different level of understanding there. And there have been several non-Indigenous faculty and staff who have been so important along my journey. And I want to acknowledge them because that's true allyship. But in my opinion, what is allyship without Indigenous faculty and staff, right? I mean, it's about doing work with Indigenous communities, not for Indigenous communities. And so I really want to acknowledge both the Indigenous and non-Indigenous faculty and staff who have been so integral along my journey. Um, and so, really, I've developed some very meaningful relationships with those folks, and they have, um, through, um, we talked about gathering spaces here at BCIT. At UBC, there's a UBC Longhouse. That's where I've met and had very um, meaningful conversations, which have in turn turned into very meaningful relationships with other Indigenous students, staff, and faculty on campus. And so, um, having those spaces and ha having those places for a safe and meaningful dialogue is important and having the, the faculty there to do that is just so integral. So that's really what I'm trying to get at here is the importance of Indigenous faculty and staff on campus. And um, I, I've identified a couple who have been mentors along my journey and I really raise my hands up to those folks um, who aren't here today, but um, they've I, I'm in my third year at UBC and I'm doing very well as a result of their mentorship along this journey. So I did really just wanted to share those few words with you and um, I am grateful to have been asked to speak here and I too would like to thank the elders who have opened up and allowed us to do this work here today. I raise my hands up to you and thank you for your continued resilience and work on this campus. Um, so I raise my hands up to each and every one of you for taking the time to be here today and listen to um, the conversations and learn from one another. And I wish you the very best in the work moving forward. So thank you. Hoichka Gela Kessla. Thank you, Adina, for her uh, sharing for her experience with us. Uh, it really means a lot. Thank you. And I would like to invite Zad now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Let's all thank Sean. Oh, man. And all the guest speakers. Thank you so much for those powerful stories. Now you get to see me fumble around a little bit with my notes, <laughs> having to follow that. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, so at, along, that, along that theme, right, it's like, who, how are we helping out within institutions? How can we help and look inside and, and really help out from a personal and then build community? How are we reaching out and breaking down silos or looking at ways to engage with others that we may not speak with on a regular basis? 
So that's really a lot what Diversity Circles has brought forward. And we're not saying we're doing this on our own. We're, we're, we're using the community and acknowledging the community on a regular basis to make this all happen. And this is really the, the heart and the, and the, the self of our, our diversity circles. Um, and as you mentioned, or, and as you saw, the, the um, Indigenous community is, is here, right? And that's um, uh, a very important part of this project. Um, with the team, we also had a, a young academic, I won't say young, but I'm, I'll probably look pretty young, I don't know. <laughs> That's, uh, that's uh, Andrew Judge, he's in the Shabe, and he was uh, a really a big part of our, of our project as well. Uh, Aaron Hunter, who's a faculty member with SOCAS. Uh, Robert Dom, as you saw in the video. And of course, our amazing student ambassadors. Let's give them another round of applause. Very important. So myself, I'm of uh, uh, Dak Health and Irish descent. So I share that quite openly, and I share the, the fact that my father went through Lejac and that his education was taken away from him through the Lejac Residential School. I share that quite openly because that's my perspective. And I, I'm not taking away from anyone else's perspective, I'm only adding to the conversation and the dialogue. Looking at ways that myself as a Clasden or DAC Health member can, can, can invite community members down from up north ways that we can here at BCIT acknowledge the protocols and tr the traditions that we have as, as First Nations people. And as Adina mentioned, as non-Indigenous people, as allies. So I'd like to bring up, I see them hunching back a bit. So I'd like to bring up our DAC Health uh, community that we brought down, um, and that's uh, Elsie Joseph and Jane John. some nice seats here for you. And Elsie's going to share a little bit about the gifts that she's brought down, and then we'll go from there. Thank you, uh, BCIT uh, um, faculty members, for inviting us uh, to be a part of your uh, celebration you have in here to recognize other Dakil uh, uh, communities that is around your area here. And I thank them for inviting us here. And um, <coughs> I didn't expect this. Um, Za has uh, changed this, uh, this, maybe for, this is the third time I've had to, I had to cancel twice before because I couldn't make it. And each time it's something different I had to do. I was supposed to come down here and <laughs> teach people how to do, uh, put beadwork on moose hide. And, and now, um, just kind of unexpected. <laughs> I just have the uh, just honored that I was the one to be asked to do the gifts for BCIT to give to the the special people they're gonna give it to, and um, my niece Jen is here to support me and has helped me with some of the stuff. Um, I've never spoken <laughs> spoken to this many people before. <laughs> And, uh, and I'm just so, um, I am so proud of uh, what Azaz really trying to do. He's gone a long ways to where he is at now. And I'm just so grateful. Um, I beating and doing. Um, Handicraft work and beading to me is not something I go around and I make to sell to people. But if I, if I have to and you ask, I would. But most times it's my hobby. It's something that I love to do. 
And um, most times I don't even expect, like I'll gather a whole bunch of things that I'll make and then all of a sudden something will come up and then, wow, there's my chance to donate all this. I can donate to that, to them to get what they want. Like I'll donate it to potlatches and I'll donate it to schools to give to uh, the schools uh, to give uh, children, uh, they'll raffle it out for children that will go on their end of the year school trips. Like I have three grandchildren going to one First Nation school. So that's, that's how I do it. It makes me feel good that I can do that. And, um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, and I've been doing uh, my beading for, like I was, I started like when I was about eight years old. It's always been my passion. It's uh, something I've always done, and I teach my children, my grandchildren, how. My I have a great grandchild that made this for me when she was like five years old. Um, <laughs> and right now she's learning how to uh, do loom beading and she's learning how to, uh, she knows how to sew on a sewing machine. Her mother doesn't know how. <laughs> 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 and uh, she knows how to sew beads onto moose hide already. And she's at a school where she uh, is able to, she's in grade six now. And she's able to uh, stand in with her class and she can teach them what I taught her, which makes me so proud. And uh, she's not like me, I'm nervous and everything. If it was her here, she'll just be going on and on and on. Because <laughs> uh, she, loves, she loves the attention and, uh, and she's the same way. She's always making something for someone. Like what I do, she'll do little rings, she'll do necklaces, anything, braided um, moose hide, even uh, yarn maybe she'll find. She'll make some of the friendship bracelet, you see. And that school that she is going to, that is what they do. I mean, they teach the children everything, how to do their meat, their fish, how to go fishing, trapping, and, and they still keep up with the... With the uh, regular, uh, how you say it, uh, they keep up with the regular schooling for, um, how do we say that? Uh, anyway, I don't know, but anyway, they do keep up, even though they do lots of um, dark health work, and I just feel happy that I have been a part of that, and like I've been helping her to teach. She's already teaching, and and I'm just so happy. I just I thank uh, BCIT for asking us to come here. And actually, um, they put us in heaven down here. <laughs> <laughs> and I thank them so much. Like I'm just in awe as how we've been treated so far. It's been it's been uh, very beautiful. I thank all of you so much, and so many beautiful people here. And I do. Uh, uh, appreciate what you are trying to do and I encourage everyone to do what you are doing and like this should be going on in all schools what you are doing now that would be nice for all schools throughout Canada or whatever yes That means thank you for being here. I'd like to also acknowledge Jane. And uh, nerves are up, so we'll we'll just talk about the next section. I'll bring um, Splash up to sit with us as well. So the next part is the passing of gifts. So as you meant, as you as you heard. Uh, Elsie speak about the north and coming down into the community here of the Coast Salish people and how we can acknowledge that and as Splash mentioned the passing of that open and the, and the, the, the relationships that exist. 
So I reached out, of course, to our Grand Chief, Ed John, who's our Claston, uh, our Chief, asked him some advice. So how does this, you know, how does this work? I don't have the, I don't know, I'm not the expert on protocol. And <laughs> so. so he said the relationships have always existed between our nations. The sea, there was seafood recently sent, sent up, up north from Musqueam from Trent Sparrow for our late, uh, our past, uh, past uh, Juice de Monk's uh, funeral services. That was this, this past week. At Diversity Circles, we really hope to add to this relationship that happens between communities. Coming down to acknowledge the, the Coast Salish territories and the people. And being at BCIT, how we can provide guidance and advice around equity as people. So I'm going to pass these along, symbolizing, as you see on the screens here, and actually Shannon and Kyla can come up, and the, the young ones can come up now. Our messengers, what was that you said about youth, Splash? Yeah. <laughs> so as you see on the screens, we have our, our Diversity Circles team. And we want to acknowledge the gifts that are coming from the north into the Coast Salish territory. And we want to provide these to the, 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 our gifts today uh, and honor the witnessing and, and, and the, the acknowledgement that the Coast Salish people have. So we'll pass these to Mary. Just to further explain, we as Coast Salish people, when we have a gathering, bring people to the gathering of the minds as you would in English. In, in our way, it would be for a funeral, a wedding, a naming, a memorial, puberty rites. And we would invite people together. And you would not just eat and leave again. Yeah. You, you sat there and you listened from the beginning to the end. You did not get up and leave whenever you felt like it. And um, you were hand-selected. The invitations went out blanket, but certain people were specially invited. That's why I said meeting of the minds. And when, the guy, when we came together, um, before contact, it was material things. We didn't know money. And we would give certain gifts, handmade gifts. And this is how we grew up. I have, you talk about diversity. I have a difficult time standing up here. The Anthony Squeezy Tanatan, Swalastanatan, Kulastanat, because it does nothing to your mind to understand what I just said. I have jobs within my community that then it's meaningful for me to communicate those words. This is why I don't wear regalia. I don't. I believe you will take me at face value. Of, I'm from Musqueam territory. I don't need um, to bless you to sing a song. But I feel this is very powerful because when I first went up to Tlatsan territory, their territory was how I grew up as a child. They do beadwork, my grandmother did baskets, and she traded to raise us up. And um, there we knew that diversity that was not vet, Metro Vancouver, it was Point Grey area that we were in, and it was like a trade that's how we grew up. And um, when I went up to their territory, that reminded me, like we didn't go anywhere Vancouver built around us. But when I, I went up to their territory, it's so beautiful, you know, there was no pollution. It reminded me of when I was a, a child. And then, you know, you're talking about diversity. And how much of these do these children, you know, experience that? We've seen when it, you know, Vancouver was not a polluted area. 
and a, a very low population. But just to give you a, in, in, a, in a nutshell what um, the witnessing is about, like the, the, the children here are going to go and hand out these tokens and when people will ask you, what is that you have? And you will tell them this, I went to the diversity meeting with the Tlaxon people, the Squamish people, we came together and this is what I took away from it. You know, this is what I learned. This is what I experienced. So that two years down the road when they have another diversity meeting and they ask you, what, how, how long has this been going on and what did you learn at this meeting on March, you know, then, then you will say, well, here's my, wit <laughs> my witness and this is what I learned. So just to explain to you what these students are gonna go around and hand to you. Thank you for listening. So as we mentioned earlier, we have some folks in the room who participated in those 8x8s, eight and so we'd like to give you some gifts and recognition. And so Saren and Max and Isla are going to deliver. So if we can ask the people who are here to please stand up who participated in 8x8. Eight eight. Don't be shy. There's actually quite a few of you here. And while the kids go around, I'm going to just read out the names of everybody that was able to participate so that we can honor everyone who was in so, kids, you can go about, and I'm going to read out some names. Alana Kruger, Alex Gowans, Alex Herrot, Alf Dumont, Allison Griffin, Amber Butterworth, Ambreen Sharif, Amy Smith, Anna Lopez, Andrew Judge, Annabelle Hung, Bonnie Johnston, Chris Rogerson, Dan Post, Danielle Landetta Gautier, Daryl Wong, Glenn Magel, James Rout, Jennifer Tallman, Jenny Yang, Jesse Darnell, Joanne Stone Campbell, Jonathan Smith, Judy Phipps, Justin Arsenault, sorry, Justine, that should say, Justin Wilson, Kathy Manson, Kathy Roberts, Kim Dotto, Kimberly Carter, Corey Wilson, Christy Obradovich, Lauren Swanson, Lori Sinet Lee, Leslie Koshesne, Lily Montague, or oh, sorry, Montagady, Lisa Bolton, Lynn Joseph, Mary Roberts, Michael, who's right over there. <laughs> you should stand as well. Michael Mandrisiak, Michelle Keatley, Mike Newell, Nicola Jackson, Patricia Sackville, Paul McCullough, Robert Dom, Sarah Candathiel, Simon John, Steve Eccles, Susan Burgess, Susanna Can. Terry Gordon, Trevor Leismeister, Wayne Hand, and Wendy McLeod. Thank you so much to all of you for your participation and your support and for the work that you do here at BCIT. You can still stand if you like. We're going to have a share a song now.
Thank you so much. And it's, it's very hard to, it's always very hard to follow a panel like that and to follow Splash as singing. So thank you. Thank you, panelists, everyone. Um, we're almost at the end of our appointed time. However, we do not want you to rush away if you can stay, if you can linger for a few minutes. Um, our student ambassador, Dennis, is, as was mentioned, has done some work on mapping, digitizing our maps. And so Dennis is going to put his work up on the uh, television. And so please visit with him. Uh, Michael, who was mentioned earlier, is visiting us um, from the Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Center, is an amazing silk screening artist. So we asked him to bring some samples of his work. Um, Jane and Elsie, who is a Catholic artist, artist are, will be sitting over there also. Um, they were kind enough to bring some examples of their work, just for your interest. Or if you want to ever uh, follow up this event, they have a mailing list if you would like to hear from them or connect with them further. Visit with all the guests. And especially, I know at our table we were slow, so three of us didn't introduce ourselves yet. So if you didn't yet have a chance to really just share with the people at your table to finish sharing, we're going to finish introducing ourselves, but also if there was someone at your table who stood up, in other words, someone who participated in an eight by eight, you might just want to ask that person, uh, you know, what was that like? What is this eight by eight thing? Ask them about uh, their experience. That would be great too. So please um, you know, linger for a few minutes if you can. And uh, thanks again to everyone for coming today.